Ah, yeah, yucca truculiana. Here we go. This is that good stuff. See these fruits, those three carpeled ovaries? All right, see that? Get the little black flakes inside. This is this is good stuff. We're going to collect some of these. They're not ready yet. It'd be better if they were actually brown, but you can see the seam. That seam right there in between the fruits is already turning brown. That means it's probably good. It's better to collect these things when they're already brown, but, uh, you know, obviously, you know, do what you can. It's uh, We're not going to be here for that. So I'm just going to collect them now, and then I'm going to let... I'm going to go ahead and uh, put them in a paper bag, let them mature on their own, and then that'll, the seeds inside will still probably be good. The ants are all over these, probably harvesting the, uh, the uh, some sort of damn sucker insect that's on those. Yeah, see, they cut one of these open, the seeds inside, the, the uh, seeds are still white. You want them to be black, so this ain't ready yet, but you let it sit in a bag, dry out in a paper bag, and uh, hopefully in a week, it'll probably still, the you know, seeds will you know, mature anyway. If they're black, they're good. I mean, obviously these are not, they look like they're close though, all right? But really color is the big, they got that phytomelanin in them, that black, which is, you know, a lot of members of Asparagales, the order, which this Yucca Truculiana is in. I have that black, that phytomelanin, and that's when you know they're good. And I'm going to cut a couple, I'm going to cut a couple for shits and giggles anyways, put them in a bag, and when they open on their own, uh, hopefully in a week or two, uh, I'll, the seeds will be good, but... Whew, a lot of saponins in there, you know. Soap. The, a lot of a lot of the yuccas have that, you know. You could make soap out of them. Anyway, obligate moth pollination on these. So these were pollinated by a yucca moth, and then there's probably yucca moth larvae in some of these eggs, as there usually tends to be. It's kind of like a you scratch my back, scratch yours. You pollinate my, uh, you pollinate the uh, ovaries, and I'll let your larva eat some of the seeds. Not all of them, but some. Look at that. It's the orange phenotype of Opuntia alta slash Lindheimeri slash Engelmanii. And why do I say all those three species episodes? Because I don't know what the fuck this is. And I don't care. To be honest, no offense. Plus, they're probably all banging each other and hybridizing anyway. What I give a shit about is that this is orange flowered, not yellow flowered. So it's a, it's a recessive allele that codes for the orange flowers, not the yellow ones. And I want a pad, so I'm going to come snip one off, put it in my garden nice. Who knows what's selecting for it, or if anything in the environment is selecting for it. Maybe nothing is selecting for it. Look at how deep red those get. Could Maybe it could be a hummer selecting for it. Consolia maniliformis, which is a tree, prickly pear from the Dominican Republic, uh, gets selected for by hummers, or got selected for, but now it's primarily hummer pollinated. So I don't know if that's what's going on here, nor am I saying that. I just like the fucking orange color, so I'm going to cut a pad off, root it, put it in my goddamn garden. There you go. You know, because I seen all these butterflies, and I said, wow. I said, that's a lot of them over there, those uh, Cricogonias. See, these guys, those those sulfur butterflies, you know what their host plant is? It's Guayacan. You know, member of the creosote family, which I don't even see any here, but there's plenty in a region, you know. But see that? You could see all of them. They're just lurking hard. They're all getting, you know, ending up in the vents of the trucks and stuff. You know, ending up, ending up smattered all, all up, up, up down a windshield, all that kind of stuff. But there's got to be, you know, three or four million within the surrounding 20 square mile area. So, wonder what eats these things when they're caterpillars, you know. You could see them on this Texas thistle right here. That's, that's nice. I said, wow, next time, you know, I feel like committing homicide, I just come out. Here it's 93 degrees, you know, kind of chilly for South Texas, and I just uh, just take a nice little meditation on us and, and take it all in. You know, it's not so bad. It's gonna be fine. Just you gotta stop playing into the conflict algorithm. And oh, that's nice. That's really nice. There's a fucking lot of butterflies down there. That's a shit ton. There's a shit lot of butterflies there. It looks like snow. I feel like I'm in a snow globe. You know, I feel like I'm in Ozzy's nose. You know. Or, or uh, what's that, like Stevie Nicks' nose, you circa 1975. You know, I just, I don't understand why all the coleopterans, all these beetles need to copulate in the flowers. You got the soldier beetle, coleognathus, is that guy. See, look, they're all just, they're banging on the thistle flower, you know. But I think the predominant pollinator of, uh, of all the thistles right here are these damn, these damn lovely, uh, uh, Cricogonias, you know, the sulfurs. See, they, you see all of them? That's a nice plant. I'm going to collect some seed today, too. See what's so fluffy and shit? I'm going to get some of those seeds, too. See, there, there you go. 
see they get a couple of them at the, at the base of that that floof that puffball you got those brown thick looking seeds that's nice i was looking for it sure enough i was looking i always confuse it with colubrina but we found a texas salmon and it's loaded with fruit so i'm going to collect a shit ton of these they need a hot stratification and i'm going to be uh hopefully growing a shit ton look at it always it looks a lot like Colubrina Texensis, which is in Ramnesi, but uh, you get the, the leaves on this are slightly different. And I actually brought a branch of Colubrina Texensis to compare. See, they look a lot alike, except that, you know, Colubrina Texensis te can have much broader leaves than the Texas almond. You get a different leaf texture there, too. See, there's the Texas almond, and there's the venation on the uh, Colubrina Texensis. Look at that. Oh, I'm so happy to find this thing because I want these goddamn seeds. I'm going to grow a shit ton of this plant. It's fucking rare in cultivation. We're going to grow a ton. We're going to give it to uh, maybe give to some native nurseries around here. You know, put a couple in the ground as stock plants. Get it passed around. All right. And there is that, uh, that fruit again. Just scrape off that pericarp. You want that big seed inside. This is technically a droop and uh, good to go. Look at that. You got the kid waiting in the truck, okay? The, the two leaves on the left are Colubrina, the close look like that also has divaricating zigzag branches, and then that one leaf on the right is the Texas almond. See, you got it like kind of a, a more toothed margin on the Texas almond, as well as instead of having that, that same venation, it's you know like a birch leaf, the Texas almond leaf has more of like a papillose, kind of warty. more papillose kind of warty texture to it see it so it's mostly just the texture not even the leaf margin you can't even rely on like the leaf margin you most got to look at the text anyway and then of course when you can see the fruit you know you could tell colubrina they look way different anyway i'm fucking stoked i'm gonna go collect the shit ton of seeds we're gonna grow this out and uh you know hopefully uh get them out to people in the region all right native plant nurseries other growers get a few stock plants in the ground this is a really important plant rare throughout its range but does great once you get in the ground and again, doesn't get that big. I think that's Diospora back there. I think this is it. I think it, I've never seen one taller than three or four feet. Shit, there's an old one. It smells like apricots. It really does. Maybe it's more, maybe it's more appropriate to call it the Texas apricot. I don't know what the shit you call it. I just want to grow hundreds of them. Woo, it's already getting hot. Look, we got Phlox down there, that pink guy. We got, uh, what is that, Cato Papa. We got a bunch of nice stuff. We got, uh... Stenaria nigra cans, ruby AC. Look at that. Look at it, the yellow button heads on that uh, Cato Papa once the, the white uh, ligules fall off. Yeah, see there? There's Colubrina Texensis. Just covered in butterflies. See how that? Look at that. Look at all those. Look at it. They're mobbing it. Because it's in bloom. You can barely see the flowers. They're just these tiny little typical of the buckthorn family ram. They say never put out too showy flowers. Look at that bright red fruit. Looks like a scrotum. Can you say, see, I said, you know, scrotum almost sounds more offensive than nutsack. I'm sorry. I was trying to, you know, tone it down for the kids. But uh, well, I'll just say nutsack. You can see those tiny flowers. See that? Oh, oh, oh. See, it's got that zigzag branch. It really does look like Prunus Texana. It really does. And then you see those flowers. The flowers even look a little bit like Prunus Texana. But you can see the sepals alternate with the petals there. See that? You get those little weird, they look like little, you know, little paddles in between those big pentagonal petals. And you get that nectar disc. So that's not a rosaceae flower, that's a ramnaceae flower. It looks almost like a ceanothus flower, a zyphus flower, etc. But I wonder why. I wonder if there's been something selecting for Prunus texana and Colubrina texensis resembling each other. Really weird. It is really bizarre. Still fools me. I've been obsessed with the, you know, the Texas salmon for three years now. I still get fooled. Get the old spot for the abronias. Abronia amelia. We got this menzilia too. This menzilia nuda. Look at that white stem. Flowers closed off because it's moth pollinated. So they'll be opening tonight. Big white flowers out here in a sand sheet. Hot as fucking ball. Actually, it's not that bad. It's kind of nice. It's kind of nice right now. This scabbard. Oh. Oh, I love those leaves, those Velcro leaves. That's such a cool menzelia. We got this this, uh, this annual croton, too. Where the fuck did it go? There it is. It's a small one. They can get upwards of four feet tall. That's a nice one. Look at that. 
Yeah, what is this fucking croton? Is it an annual or is it a herbaceous perennial or what? Certainly it doesn't get doesn't seem to get woody up here, but look, it seems plants are dioecious, not monoecious. So that not just the flowers, but the plants themselves are unisexual. There's there's the male. Look how fuzzy all this shit is on a sand sheet. Look at that. Look how fuzzy. It's so fuzzy, huh? A lot of fuzzy plants on a sand. So there's a male with those staminate flowers, and then over here. God, the wind is really a motherfucker. The, over here, look at these ovaries. Look at this. Look at those papillos over. Look at that. Those swollen ovaries, those papillos ovaries with the those brown withered stigmas up top. God, that's a weird fruit. Little star-shaped uh, bracts beneath it. I guess would that just be the sepals? Jesus. That's a very bizarre shape to a croton for still got the three carpels there, you 4 BAC. See, there we go, out here on a sand sheet. This is, this is prime Prunus Texana habitat, and the pigs are gorging, gorging on them, so we're letting them collect them for us. Yeah, hey, come on. Neither one of us is too good to touch a little bit go. of pig shit. <laughs> Probably some fucking parasites in there. There's another pile of shit over here. We just came here to pick shit, officer. That's the reason we're illegally trespassing right now. See that Skyzacrium, Scoparium everywhere. God, this is such a unique habitat. It's not dense because of that sand. That sand is too fast draining and nutrient poor, so it doesn't get dense. Stays low, dominated by grasslands, or by grasses, excuse me, the little blue stem. Okay, which obviously, remember, that's C4 photosynthesis. A lot of grasses really heat tolerant. They like, they thrive in the grass. And then you can see you got the fruits beneath the prunus down there. See, the pigs are messy eaters. You still got some of these, too. These are green. But these will still, these are still good. They'll, they'll ripen, you know? The, the embryo inside is still good. So we're going to pick a shit ton of this. And we're going to go give it to people to grow. Because I want to see more. If I, if I pick seeds now, get them out there, that means that in a couple years, I might see this in cultivation somewhere. Beautiful Texas day. Look at this. We got a little ground cherry there, too. Little physalis. Oh, it's ready. Is it sweet? Mmm. It is. Indeed it is. Look at it. See that? See they got, so they got this divaricating branching, this zigzag branching, which kind of creates a cage, which I'm noticing is I have to reach in there to get seeds, to get fruits. You know, it's, fruits, a, it's a single seeded fruit, it's a droop, or a single, you know. Because if it had many seeds, it'd be a berry. But anyways, I'm reaching in there, I'm noticing, oh, this cage structure makes it kind of hard. Maybe the adaptive benefit of that zigzag branching is that it creates this cage around it so that, you know, predation on the fruits is not too extensive. You know, this is probably, probably benefits more from bird dispersal of fruits than, you know, deer or pig dispersal of fruits. But who knows? I don't know. And some of those piles of shit back there look real nice. You know, it's not often I say that about a pile of shit. Well, I've been known to remark about it. You know, you see like a big homeless patty in the, no offense, but you know, you see a big homeless patty in Emeryville Bay Area or something. I got always remark. I've taken pictures of shit sometimes. I've taken pictures of human shit. I've been impressed, you know. When you get a, a one that's like got a good girth on it, I mean, how can you not, right? Oh, this, this is, look at that. That's nice. So they don't quite turn yellow. Well, maybe they do eventually. But you can see they turn kind of a red first. So these are all great. So there's about 30, 40 to 50 actually seeds there. So that's, this is going to be a good home. I'm going to be here for a minute. It's a Phanostephus ramosissimus, I believe, that white flower. There's also an Erigeron out here. And then look at who I found here. Little pipe vine swallowtail caterpillar just hanging out, doing his thing. Looking weird as all hell, like something out of that uh, Metroid Nintendo game. Massive Prunus Texana. See, I'm just kind of scared to stick my hand in there because sometimes you get diamond bags hanging out beneath these things. But, uh, do it slowly. Yeah, that's the, that's the fucking benefit of this zigzag branching. I bet there's no other there's no other reason for it. It's it's to create a cage so you can't you can't go in there if you're a mammal. Stick your head in there, a browsing mammal like a fucking pig or a deer, and get the uh, pick these things off. Because there's a good chance if you're you know a deer, or some would crack the seed open, and damage the embryo. Whereas if you're a bird. You're not going to do as much damage, like a big corvid or something, or a grackle. You go in there, eat that shit, swallow it, 
pericarp comes off, you shit it out. Could a bird, the seat is kind of big though. Could a bird pass the, I don't know, maybe. Who knows? But it seems to be that case, the creating a little cage to prevent fruit predation. They'll get the ones out here, but they won't get all of them. They won't get the ones inside. It ensures that some of the embryos, the seeds make it. See, and there's Diospros texana fruit, which is also edible. Ooh, and fuzzy too. Order Ericales, order of blueberries, but in Ebenaceae, the family Ebenaceae, but it's not ready yet. You got a, I don't know, probably another month it looks like. They're, they're squishy though, they're good. They're actually good. Texas native persimmon. Like, there you go, Berberus trifoliata, the South Texas ecotype though. Slightly darker green and not as glaucous and blue as the uh, the West Texas one. It's the South Texas ecotype, so it's you know, it's growing on sand. So this is going to be more adapted to the climate down here, which is generally way fucking hotter. God, this suck to collect. Gee, I just the, the fucking leaves are so spiny. God, they just hurt. Obviously, going for bird dispersal. This would be a great native plant in the garden. Just a living bird feeder. You know, I like getting a bird stuck to get them coming through. I'm just, yeah, it's it's wild. I normally think of this as needing cold winters, but here's an ecotype that uh, can obviously handle, uh, you know, the hotter and the drier. I mean, West Texas is pretty fucking dry, but still. Can, I suppose you could make a nice lemonade out of them berries, and the root is medicinal too. It's got berberine in it. From berberidaceae, the berberidaceae family. Oh, this is cool. So look, at that's a nice dispersal mechanism. So Thelosperma, Philofolium, Asteraceae, obviously. Look, there's a little fly in there. You got those uh, kind of mahogany, burgundy-colored disc florets. But check out the wind dispersal on those seeds. See that black part's the seed, and then the whole, uh, the rest of the pappus, it's got those, those fringed scales, those fringed scale margins, and it just turns into a little sail. You can see the pappus up top. Those little brown bars, that's fucking wild. That button looking thing is the receptacle, and then that black is the seed. So obviously going for wind dispersal. Pretty cool, holy shit, never really looked at that before. Learn something new every time I come out here. Philofolium, obviously, because it's got that filamentous foliage. Remember the Coreopsis tribe of Asteraceae. This is hilarious. So there's, there's the caterpillar. All right, we know it only the only host plant for it is Aristolochia, but all I see is this this grass there, this invasive uh, KR, this uh, Kleberg blue stem. But then right there, you could see that's not a grass, that's a dicot, and it's it's that's what he's munching on. That's Aristolochia erecta. God, it blends in so well. How the fuck do these caterpillars find these things? More people got to be growing this plant. Really cool flowers when it blooms, and uh. Obviously, it's a host plant for a fucking really cool-looking butterfly. See, it doesn't always require trespassing. It's just sometimes it's uh, what you got to do. See, here's some right on the side of the road. They got that silvery color, whereas Colubrina texensis has a green color. And they also, of course, have that big fruit. Colubrina texensis. Where's what I showed you earlier, anyway? Look at that. Look at all that Prudus texane. I think this is oil company land. I don't know. Not going to discourage trespassing, no. And then, of course, there's that physalis, too. That ground cherry. Another edible. And then over here, we got Daucus pusillus, a native carrot. Is that it? No, maybe this... No, that's not it, actually. Those seeds are not sticky. Holy shit, it's Tasahio in flower. Oh, God. Almost never see this. Look at it. Very beautiful flowers. Very exquisite. The sluttiest choya. Hybridizes with every other cylindrical punches species, supposedly. Where at the co-occurs throughout its range and yeah, look at that I wonder what pollinates it white petals and uh exerted stigma many stamens god it's such a mean fucking plant Get the bird dispersed fruits obviously you know I, i've lived in south texas four years now been coming here for 10 and i've still i've never actually seen leptocollis cylinder punch of leptocollis in flower ah 